excited. Today our message is uh, women of worth. Women of worth. And now, women are caught in kind of a weird place in our society. There's kind of two extremes. There's the extreme of women having no value and being subservient and, look, woman, just do what I want you to do kind of thing. And, you know, unequal pay, unequal positioning, unequal value, all of those things. And then there's the other side of the feminism, one where women have to rule and dominate and, and, and lose the perspective on the other side too. And so what it does is it causes this like war between these two sides and women don't really even know what God says about who they really are. And, and they're often diminished and value not put on them because we've maybe misinterpreted some scripture and maybe we've misinterpreted God's heart towards women. And so today we want to re- you to realize that moms, I mean, your job is thankless and huge. You know, if you've got kids at home, you are everything. You're the cook. You're the taxi driver. You're the doctor. You're everything to these kids. And then as we grow up, as our kids grow up, how many of you know parenting never ends? My parent, my kids are all like in their 20s and 30. And, you know, parenting never ends. Our heart is still to want to serve them and, and to see God do their best. And so it never ends. It's a, it's a huge, huge job. So I want to just, we just want to take today and speak to to women and to mothers so that you biblically see God's value for you. So we're going to go right back to the beginning. Genesis 2, okay, verse 18. It says, now the Lord God said, and this is when he had created Adam already. He says, now the Lord God said, it is not good, beneficial for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was what it was named. And the man gave names to all the livestock and the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. Aren't you glad God, guys, you should be grateful that God didn't make the cows your companion for life, okay? (laughs) Just saying, okay? Amen. Yeah. It's here. Okay, God created all these trying to find a companion. Well, praise God in his wisdom, he took it a step further, right? So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib which the Lord took had taken from the man he had made, fashioned, formed into a woman and he brought her and presented her to the man and then adam said this is now bone on my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called whoa man uh, because she was taken out of man awesome you know it's interesting because the lord didn't take a foot bone are you hearing me out of adam to control he took a rib and then did what did he do he what fashioned. Everybody, men say fashioned. I know it's painful for me to say this, but (laughs) creating beauty, fashioned. You know that DNA was put into you by God from the beginning. That's why with men, sometimes we can live in dirt and it doesn't really bother us that much. It's true. We can't see it sometimes. Amen. And women walk in and they're like, ay, 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 ay. Because they want to what? Create beauty out of the way they've been fashioned. So there's some unique things here to see because God was very instrumental, even if you back up to verse 18, where he says, I will give them a helper. And so here's the definition. I want you to see this. Verse 18. Now the Lord God said, it is not good, beneficial for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper. Now where scripture has been twisted in this whole thing is we think that, well, a woman is there just to serve a man where whatever I need, it's her job to help that happen. And it's become a subservient role. But we need to understand what that word actually means. Now, that word helper is actually the, um, the word easer. I think that's how you said it. It's actually a term used for military help and ascribed to God himself 14 times. It can be translated strong rescuer. Okay, I don't think any one of us in our relationship with God would say that God is just, oh, he's just there to help me out sometimes. Would we? No, he is the one who, who helps us accomplish what we do in our lives. He's the one we serve. He's the one we love. He's the one who we would turn our lives upside down in order to do what he wants. Amen. And that same word 
is the one here that's actually put to the woman. Amen. Yeah, women, yeah. Whoa. You better repeat that again. It's <laughs> awfully quiet in here. See, this is not a woman in your life is not a subservient role. It is actually a powerful, life-changing role that, that, that we are honored to have women in our lives. Amen. Whether it's a wife, a mother, a sister, a, a woman you know, whatever, they deserve the honor because God put them with the same word, helper, as he described himself, which is mind-blowing. When I, when I learned this years ago, it was like, Whoa! Right? All of a sudden, and I want to go on that. Woman is not inferior to man, but his equal partner and his first line of defense. She is not just an assistant, but God's solution. God's solution to man's loneliness as one who protects, reveals, and helps him. Not just in marriages, but in society. Amen. This goes back to he took her from a rib, a partner, a side partner, not a dominating under my feet, not a leg bone or a shin bone, but a rib. And so we're close. And when we start understanding the value of this is when all of a sudden the women in your life can speak deeper value and deeper meaning into you. You know, it's interesting because even when it says, I will make him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary to him. Now I want you to see this because counterpart translated um, says the opposite. Like his opposite. Like his opposite. So some of you say, my wife is nothing like me. Or your ladies, you can say, my husband is nothing like me. I say, good news. Two of you would kill each other. Yes. Right? I'd have divorced myself a long time ago if I was married to me. I'm going to be honest. Well, here's why God does that. Because if you look at your fingers and you look at the tip of your finger and say, this might be the strength of your finger. This might be the weakness. Strength, weakness, strength, weakness, so and so. And this hand would represent a man. The woman's hand is exactly the opposite. But what happens is when you bring them together, united the strengths all stick up. And see, if you, if, you, if you think, well, I'm just going to put up with her, she's the ball and change, because we hear that nonsense all the time. The problem is when women are devalued, when women are not given their, their place to flow in society as, a, as an equal partner to a man, you miss or rob yourself on what God is really trying to do. Oh, it's quiet in here now. See, we believe this church is a church that not only men, but also women can be in leadership and have, and have things, it roles that, that run at the same level as men. Are you hearing me? Yes. Because Jesus himself role modeled that for us. But society says, oh, well, you know, pastor, I just want to let you know, when you're up there, I can feel the anointing, but when your wife's up there, it just falls on deaf ears. I have people tell me that. I said, well, you're in the wrong church. Come on, people, let's be honest. If God puts something supernatural together, who am I to question what he's doing? See, I believe, in, I believe that, that women, God's put gifts on each and every person. And ladies, for some of you, you've been beaten down so bad, you've listened to the lies of the devil. You've listened to him saying you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not skinny enough, you're too skinny. And, and, and you've diminished yourself. You've allowed yourself to be. You'll never add up to anything. You'll never be significant. Or I need a man on my arm to make me look successful. Now, I think you should have a good looking man on your arm. If he's going to be your partner in life. Are you with me? Who's going to honor you properly. Treat you like the proper gift that God has given him. Yes. I'm preaching a little bit, but... I'm not trying to step on toes, but if I hear some ouches, it's okay. Because we as men have to realize that women are a gift from God to help us and to help us succeed in life. Amen? Amen? I want to just take a different side of that same statement of 
men, husbands, um, for both of them. If you are find you're stuck in your life, maybe your business isn't going to the next level, maybe your life isn't going to the next level, maybe you just feel stuck, maybe this is the key. Maybe you have not properly valued the women in your life. If you do not value the women in your life, you will not take their input. You will not value their agreement and their partnership. I think one of the greatest things um, in our success, you know, we own multiple businesses and, and wealth and all that kind of stuff because of our businesses, is because we've always come into agreement as partners. You know, even though I'm not daily involved in the business, any decision we have to talk about, he's like, no, this is our decision together. Because I can hear things from the Lord that maybe he can't. Now, he's in on the daily grind, but I'm, I, you know, I have that intuition and that instinct as well. So maybe you, you're stuck where you're at because you have not valued the women in your life. Or maybe even if you're not married, maybe it's a woman at work who has input to something you're working on and you devalue her because you don't think she knows what she's talking about. You know, when women, you're just emotional. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, let me tell you, because we're emotional, we can hear from the Holy Spirit a lot easier. Yeah, don't knock it. Don't knock it, right? Yeah, it's interesting how your voice and his voice are very similar at times. Very, yeah. very similar. Yeah. Very yeah. similar. Well, there's even a scripture, though. Do you want to talk about the scripture about... Yeah, the actually, in, in, in James, it says that don't, don't, don't mistreat your wife, otherwise your prayers will be hindered. Now, can you imagine this? One guy explained it to me very well. He says, that's his daughter, God's daughter. He says, you're messing with the father-in-law. <laughs> and he's got a big stick. And he says, when you know what you're doing and you're not doing it, he's not listening to you anymore. He's just asking one question. How is my daughter doing? I said, ouch. I said, that'll drive it home very quickly for us. But see, when we get a revelation that women are never, were never designed as inferior, they were never, ob yet even though society objectifies them, you go to some countries and they're just a, a chattel or a, an, object. an object. That's never what God designed. That never was from the beginning what God designed. You were made in his likeness, ladies, and his image. The value has already been placed on you. I want to just challenge you women, too, to demand and understand your worth. That your worth be seen. You know, and, and if you're in an abusive relationship right now, please ask one of our leaders for help. Because that is not okay. It is not okay. We want to help you because it is not okay to be abused as a daughter of the Lord, right? He, he wants to protect. But for too long, men have misinterpreted, and even women, because let me tell you, I have as many women attacking me for being in my role as I have men attacking me. Um, but they've used it to dominate women. And so we want to just look, because God tipped the scales in our favor so that you know, he, he says in, in the New Testament, it says, in Christ, there is no male or female. In other words, he's called us all equal. But here in 1 Corinthians eleven twelve, 12, it says, for although the first woman came from man, every other man, even Jesus, was born from a woman and everything comes from God. So here it's, you know, there, there can be that dominating mentality of men going, well, you know, you came out of my ribs, so I'm the dominant one. But here, where does man come from? Not one of you were born to a man. <laughs> As much as our culture tries to say it's okay and that it'll happen. And I'm okay with that. Are you with me? Man? The truth. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. We're all right with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, here's the thing is that, that God's balanced it out. He goes, okay, so if we look at actual scripture, you'll see a power that God has given. Now, culturally in Bible days... Um, we have to understand culture. Anytime you read the Bible, you have to understand the culture that was coming from. And in cultural days uh, through the Bible, women were not esteemed. We'll just put it that way, right? Like how come one guy can have like 50 wives, but one woman cannot have 50 husbands? You know, like just all these crazy things. Anyhow, but... She'd have um, a nervous breakdown. I'd have a nervous breakdown. He's one. I can only handle one. I don't know about you, but I can only handle one. Um, That's enough to handle one, she says. She calls me her but kid sometimes, too. I, do. I don't understand that. Either. I wonder. 
anyhow, um, anyways, we digress. Yeah, anyhow, keep going, so, honey. So, but historically, like the women were not allowed to learn in the temple. They were not allowed to learn under the rabbis. It was the men who had to learn, and they had to go home and teach their wives. Um, the women were not allowed to be historical um, witnesses. You see, so anytime, like even in genealogies, it's not the women you hear. It, it's Jesus, well, God himself even put women into genealogies, which was unheard of. Right, like Ruth ended up in there, you know? Yes, Rahab ended up in there. But that wasn't supposed to happen because women didn't have the value that men had. And so for um, an, a historical event to be accurate, it had to be witnessed by a man. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. Because Jesus changed that whole model with his resurrection. Because you know, the first, this is the most important piece of history for us as Christians. The most important, this is the fulfilling of the Messiah and he rose from the dead. And Jesus rose from the dead and the first person he showed up to was Mary. That should not have happened. He should have, didn't he understand culture? That it wasn't going to be heard. It wasn't going to be documented in the Bible. It wouldn't be in the history books unless he showed himself to a man. What he was doing was he was reversing that curse. Come on. He was reversing the culture that said women are not valuable. He is saying, no, you know what? The most important message of all history that is still being told today that Jesus rose from the dead, I first gave to a woman. And then he told her, he says, now go tell my disciples. And she was the first evangelist of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now here's another story. Because Jesus, through his mercy, demonstrated redemption and freedom from the mindset towards women. This is a great story found in John chapter 8. Starts in verse 4. It says, teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, but what do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that, he, that, that they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and wrote on the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up and he said, all right, let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust, when... Um, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I go and sin no more. Now, I want you to see this because the law did say that if you were caught in the act of adultery, you were to be stoned. My question is, if she was caught, where was the dude? Are you with me? He was supposed if, to be stoned. If, if he was supposed to be stoned as well. He gets a hall pass. Who is the devil going after? Are you seeing this, ladies? See, Jesus says, okay, if nobody, Jesus knew this was a setup. He could smell it from a long way away. The dude's not around. He didn't question him and say, hey, where's the guy? Because if we're going to stone him, let's get going on this. The law says this. He knew they were trying to trick him. They knew that she might have even been a setup. Are you with me? He knew what was going on. And, and then all of a sudden, he gives a supernatural pardon she should have died. Are you hearing this? She should have been stoned to death, but so should he have been stoned to death. But he said, something's not right. Something in this thing looks like we're attacking women again, and I ain't playing this game. Amen. Amen. It's really what happened. I'm not allowing her to be, be pushed out in front and, and to be scarlet lettered as she's the bad one when who is the other guy? It takes two to tangle. So after the place clears out, where are your accusers? They're all gone. 
He says, well, if nobody's here to accuse you, neither am I. In other words, I knew what these knuckleheads were up to. Are you with me? I knew what they were trying to do. Well, did she commit sin? The answer is yes. But Jesus knew that this was not just uh, this was not just a simple thing, but this was an attack against women. She made a mistake. Jesus stepped in and he says, well, I, I, I'll, I'm going to forgive you as well, but just don't go do that. Don't live that life anymore. Don't hang out in that part of town anymore. Listen, if you're struggling with alcoholism, don't hang around the bar. If you struggle with infidelity, shut off your, break, break, break your phone or whatever you need to. Don't, don't go on to social media and all that nonsense. You have to do what you've got to do. Are you with me? But he said, I'm going to pardon you, and I'm going to let you walk free. See, that's the kind of Jesus, that the, t the type of God that we serve, and that's how he looks after women. Because if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, don't you think he'll do it again? Amen. I want you to look at this. It says, man has one perspective, and God has a very different perspective. Where men devalued women, Jesus brought value, mercy, and redemption to redeem a woman's worth. You see, here he, he knew that, that things had gotten out of order. And he's like, no, I'm going to show you over and over again the value I bring to women. Over and over. And that's why you can't take one scripture out of context. Because over and over and over, Jesus keeps displaying value. He keeps displaying redemption, grace, all of this. But there's, um, there's another story we want to talk about that's in Mark 4. And because Jesus broke all cultural and religious boundaries in order to redeem women. And there was a story of Jesus and his disciples. The disciples had gone off and Jesus was going to a well for something to drink. And he ran into a woman at that well. Now she was a Samaritan woman. A Samaritan was a half Jew, half Gentile, which is non-Jew. And the Jews were, they were like outcasts. So the Jews were not allowed not allowed to associate with Samaritans. That was taboo. Plus, men were not supposed to be seen privately with women. So there was just so many cultural and religious laws being broken in this moment. And Jesus starts a conversation with her and ends up sharing his love for her and that you know he could be a water that, that, that soothes her for eternity and on and on. But what happens is in that, he starts telling her her story, that you've been married five times and the man you're currently living with isn't even your husband. And he starts reading her mail, right? And then what she does is, um, well, I'll get to that in just a minute, but, but Jesus here, here, because she's like, what? You, but you're not even supposed to talk to me. You're a Jew. You're not supposed to talk to me. What about this? What about that? But, you know, like all of these differences. But look at this. Jesus didn't focus on their differences or why they shouldn't associate. He immediately went to her worth, her value, and her deep need for redemption. He immediately spoke to her, no, but I can be your answer. I can fill you that, with a water that no, one, no other water can fill I can fill you to a place of overflowing that could never, that you'll always be satisfied. He didn't care about all the differences. He didn't care about all those other things. He instead went to her value and her worth. Now, um, the interesting thing in all of this that I find so fascinating is at the end of their conversation, because she, the Samaritans also worshipped God, but they did it at a different, they did it differently than the Jews. So they were also waiting for the Messiah. And Jesus, throughout his ministry, you'll see, he does not go around saying he's the Messiah to everybody. He, he just didn't. But here he said, woman, I am your Messiah. And it, it's like he actually revealed himself to the Samaritan woman who was broken, who had issues. He revealed himself to her. When he never, she never should have been in his presence. She never should have been allowed to be talked to him. But he revealed himself to her. Look at this. The world labeled her as a complete failure. But Jesus saw her through the eyes of value, redemption, and destiny. He didn't condemn her. He revealed himself to her. Because you know what, women? When he reveals himself to you, it changes everything about us. 
It can wipe out the shame. It can wipe out the condemnation, right? We know we're not perfect, right? We know we kind of like have a few things missing. But when we have an encounter where Jesus reveals himself to you, that, isn't, that doesn't even matter. That's our past. All of a sudden, we can step into the glorious message that he has for us. But then I want you to look I, at this. I'm going to continue okay. on here. John 4, 27 continues. And it says, just then his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to, to a woman but none of them had the nerve to ask. They're probably thinking in their back of mind, all we got to do is leave this guy unattended for a little while and he's getting us into trouble. What do you want with her? Or what are you, why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everybody. Everybody say everybody. everybody. Come and see a man who told me everything I had ever did could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the villages to see him. I want you to see something. She had a radical encounter with somebody. It should have never happened. He should have never talked to her. She wasn't qualified. It was the middle of the day. And that's why she went to the well. Because she already was ashamed of her life. You don't go to the well when it's, the sun is up and it's noontime. It's too hot. Nobody's there. That's when she was there and Jesus met her. It was a chance encounter, but was it? Are you hearing me? Yes. Ladies, this is important because for some of you, if you, if you felt shame in your life, where you felt like I've screwed up everything that I could screw up, my marriage, my kids, my this, my job, my ki- whatever it is, you can sit there and play that back and you've messed everything up. That was her. But she had an encounter with Jesus. Wasn't supposed to happen. He wasn't supposed to be there. She wasn't supposed to be there. But yes, it was the divine encounter that she had with him. And what ends up happening She goes back to the village and starts telling everybody this is the Messiah. I got inside information. He just told me who he is. And the the place starts, they all start flooding out there. She actually starts a revival. Are you getting this? Ladies, it was a woman that started one of the first revivals that Jesus told told her who she was. Yes. Why a woman? Why a color, why a woman with such a colored past? I mean, think about this. Wouldn't you want to go to somebody at the top of the food chain that's got influence, that's got this and it's got that? Because I believe when they seen her before and after, it was like, whoa, what happened here? Well, I want to read a commentary to you about this um, that I just thought would be fascinating for you to hear. It says, although she was unnamed in the biblical account, church traditions identify the Samaritan woman to be Fotini. Beautiful name, right? An internet search of her name will yield many interesting stories about her post-conversion ministry, including her being named as an apostle of Jesus and her eventual martyrdom. Regardless of the validity of these extra-biblical references, history records her as the first New Testament evangelist to win a city to Christ. God is faithful to use anyone to reach others when we are honest to tell others that Jesus knows everything we've ever done and he still loves us. Isn't that powerful? See, once again, Jesus just kept giving value to women. And these are women with shady pasts who had a lot of issues. Look at this. Jesus can redeem even the most lost And bring value to all women. He has great purpose and destiny for women bold enough to fully step into their God given calling from God. You know, so we've talked about how he can redeem. You know, some some moms in this room and some women have made just you feel like you've messed up completely. And here these are stories that just he's saying, I can redeem you. But I want to we want to just take a minute and look at another spectrum of it, of a powerful woman of God who didn't maybe have this story, but yet God still empowered her to make a big difference. And we want to learn some keys from her. And that's Deborah, who is one of the judges. And the story is found in Judges 4. Um, But she was a prophet, a judge. Um, She was a wife, probably a mother. Historically, we don't exactly know. Um, And she was a leader in the community. So she was a warrior. This girl was a warrior. Now, a judge and a prophet in Bible days was a huge role because that was God's representative to the people back then. 
So for her to have that role was not a minimal role. That was a huge role where she would be God's mouthpiece to the nation of you Israel. Know, the interesting thing, when Barak was supposed to go into, into war and, and, and the Lord spoke he to him. He was the military leader. The military leader and said, go into war and take that territory. He says, I won't go unless you come. Now think about this. This almost could be a little bit humorous if somebody would do a video on this today. The man is supposed to be the tough guy out front and he says, listen, I ain't going anywhere unless you come with. Really? Come on, ladies, this should be funny. Listen, you tie your shoelaces here. He wouldn't do anything without her. And she went into war. She went into battle with them. She was a warrior. I mean, this woman should have had a cape. She would have made Wonder Woman like, like she wasn't accomplishing <laughs> anything. But see here, Barack said, you know, you must go with us. Because he acknowledged the anointing and call of God on her life as a leader. And she told him straight up, this is a fascinating story, it's so worth reading. But he, she told him, she says, if I go with you, a woman will get credit for this victory. And still, he, didn't, he says, I need the anointing on your life, is essentially what he did. And so there's something really powerful here, is that when we realize that, that there is a power and an anointing on women that we need to acknowledge and lift up right. and Amen. respect and honor, you will flow in the benefits of that anointing. Yes. Come on. Amen? But I want to look at, we just want to pull out a, a four points about Deborah that we wanted you to look at. One, she had her spiritual life with God in order. These are things we can learn, right, as women. She had her spiritual life in order. Two, she was faithful to her husband and family. <laughs> Three, she was full of wisdom as a judge over Israel. Four, she was a fearless warrior and not intimidated by men or circumstances. So women, we can step into some of these same places as well. If we understand that one, we, just, we have a heart that's just pure for God. Let's just run after God. Let's be integrous in our families. Let's, let's honor God in our families in all of those places. Let's seek wisdom that only God can give. And let's not allow intimidation or fear to hold us back. Amen. Amen. Let I me just share this. When you understand the value and participate with the value and the anointing on the women in your life, a favor and victory will come that you will have, that you, that, that you will never accomplish alone. I want to share some stories with you because this is really a, a, something that was, that, that's, that's really powerful and I, I just hired a new accountant, and she's amazing. The guy I had wasn't that good. Are you with me? I said, let's find a woman. And so we went out, and we found one, and I was on the phone with her, with, with uh, uh, my administrator, my daughter-in-law. And she says, you've accomplished a lot of things, and you're very successful. How is it that you're like that? And I said this. I said, I surrounded myself with a lot of amazing, powerful women. Are you hearing me? See, that's the truth. And she just sat there. I could see a smile on her face and a bit of a grin. I said, that's why you're here. Are you with me? See, a lot of times we don't put value in stuff and we've had some really cool things happen in this church and I want to share some of these victories. For the young women coming up. The young women coming along in our youth. We had one of them, she was competing in Ninja Warriors and she, she was ranking all around and back and forth in competition. She just placed fifth in the world. Come on. Yeah. I was just talking to one of the other gals that's involved in dance teams and she's away a lot of times on the weekends doing the dance stuff and, and, and has a whole team she's involved in. She says, we took first place in every division that we were involved in. Yeah. And then just a couple weeks back, Aldona in her school and, and a couple of the girls that go to the... From our worship team. With, from the worship team that are in there with her, they went to compete for the musical voice stuff and they cleaned up. They took first place in every division they were involved in. Come on. These are the young women. I believe what God's starting, if we don't hold them back, 
the sky is the limit. Are you hearing me? And there's many others, and I didn't get a chance to mention them, but I just, I want you to know that we believe wholeheartedly in the call that God has on the women of this church. Listen, if we wouldn't have the amazing women, this church wouldn't be happening. Let me say that again. Without the amazing women in this church, church wouldn't be happening like it is. Can I just say, women, your, your value is going to have resistance. There's going to be resistance against your value and what God has put in you. And that's okay. Because when you understand who you are, the resistance doesn't matter. You rise above it. You know, when we first started the church, I can't, I can't even tell you how many people hated me and came at me. And it was just crazy. Um, and, and told me I needed to sit down and shut up and all these different things, right? But I remember sitting, actually, I was at a conference, actually in this place, speaking at a conference. And I'm like, God, why am I here? And literally the Lord spoke so clearly to me. And he said, you have a target on your back right now as a woman in ministry, but I've called you to take the hits so the generations behind you can get there easily. And so I, I believe so strong. I believe so strongly that I'm okay taking the hits if it provides a safe place for women to rise up in their callings. And I'm not talking about being better than men. I'm talking about equally we can serve the God with purpose and honor each other. You know, I was so I was so flat, um, honored uh, about a year ago. One of the our leaders came to us and she says, "Oh, my daughter, all she talks about this week is being a female pastor." You know, it's like yes, because they don't know anything different. But I want you to look at this Proverbs 31:10. Who could ever find a wife or woman like this one? She is a woman of strength and mighty value. Value. She's full of wealth and wisdom. The price paid for her was greater than many jewels. Now here, her, her worth is represented by the cost that Jesus Christ paid for her. He died for our men. He died for our women. He paid the same cost for both of us. We both are priceless to God. And let's not devalue one or the other. Let's celebrate each other and rise up as a church who can value, who can honor, who celebrate the moms in our life, who celebrate the men in our life, who celebrate the women and the daughters and the sisters in our lives. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you guys to stand to your feet. As we wrap up here, I want to just make sure that you have a relationship with Christ. Make sure that heaven is your home. Make sure that If something would happen to you tonight, you would say, I know for a fact where I'm going, and that's to be with Jesus. But I also want you to see there's a lot of benefits that God gives his children. Ladies, I hope you've felt that God has just empowered you to go to a whole new level. Because we need you. The world needs you. Are you hearing me? I said the world needs you. The church needs you. I believe what God's starting is something so supernatural. And I believe God is going to use women in such a powerful way to see this happen. But I want to pray for you right now. If you don't know Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're online, Winnipeg campus, say this out loud and mean it in your heart as you do and watch what God does. It goes like this. Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I ask that you forgive me. I ask that you forgive me. Come into my life. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. And help me to live for you. And help me to live for every you. Every day of my life. Every day of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray.